Good evening, everyone. Glad you're joining us for our 530 <laughs> committee meeting. Uh, tonight, we're going to hear from Rock Region Metro. And in, in case you don't know who they are, they're that, that cool, those cool little buses you see driving around town now providing transportation for, for a lot of folks. And we have a couple more coming. But anyway, I'd like to introduce uh, the CEO, Justin Avery, and uh, Miss Becca Green. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to be back among you. Uh, we were just discussing, I think the last time I saw everyone on the council um, all together was um, about a year ago, a year and a half maybe. Yeah. So it's been a minute. So um, I just want to recap a little bit about the service um, and then give you guys an update on the service and um, tell you about something that's coming our way here in the next couple of months. And I know we have at least one uh, new city council member with us, so um, I'll try to go through those slides as quickly as I can to just kind of recap where we are. So um, just to um, start off, we have the benefits of having this partnership with uh, Rockridge and Metro and the city of Conway. It engages a somewhat familiar format of ride hailing, ride sharing service um, to launch and monitor visited, visitor and resident use of public transit in Conway. Um, and it also utilizes Rockridge and Metro's experience um, as the largest transit agency in the state of managing FTA requirements um, that go along with operating transit service. And it also establishes um, the first public transit service um, outside of Pulaski County here in central Arkansas. And we're very proud of that to be here in Conway and in Faulkner County. Um, this is a map of the urbanized area of Conway and Little Rock. Little Rock's um, the urbanized area that you see in green. Of course, the urbanized area um, encompasses not only Little Rock, but also Maumelle, Sherwood, North Little Rock, um, all the cities that you see there in green, Benton Bryant. Cabot, and that is because um, those jurisdictions are close enough and um, have a sustained population density along that, that I-30 corridor that you see there and Highway 165, uh, 167, um, to uh, make those uh, groups be counted at the census level with Little Rock. So it, what it means is that if the uh, town of Bryant, for example, wants to have a public transit service and they want to be able to pull down federal dollars to put toward that service, they must use Rock Region Metro to do that because we are the designated recipient of federal public transit dollars for that area. Uh, Conway, though, a few years ago, surpassed 50,000 people in population. So that means that Conway is in its own urbanized area as determined by the U.S. Census therefore um, qualifying Conway to pull down federal funding for public transit service if they want to start a system. So um, we are using the monies meant for Conway, and they're only meant for Conway. We are not spending them anywhere else. They are, we are required to spend them on Conway service. Um, so that's how that comes about. And, the, and again, this map is determined by the U.S. Census Bureau. It's not determined by the Federal Transit Administration. Um, so just a recap of the history of our agreement, um, in 2018, Conway uh, City Council voted to uh, make Rock Region Metro the designated recipient of its 5307 urbanized area formula funding. That's what those funds are called at the federal level. And um, they remain with us, but again, they're earmarked for Conway Transit and transit-oriented development projects. So that's where they are spent, and they cannot be used for any other purpose. And in 2019, Rock Region Metro launched our first microtransit service in Little Rock, in the John Barrow Road area, for those who are familiar with that area. And then um, in 2021, Conway came to us and said, okay, we're ready to start this program, but we'd like to do microtransit service. Um, for those who were on the council back in 2018, you may remember that we started considering a van pool service, and we ended up doing microtransit instead. And because uh, during uh, 2021, we were in the COVID uh, pandemic, the uh, coronavirus pandemic, there actually had been made available through the pandemic CARES Act funding for this service as well. So Conway, being in its own urbanized area, uh, gets its own CARES Act funds as well. So the great thing about CARES Act funding with public transit agencies is they can be spent and um, uh, they have less restrictions on the spending than some of our other funding pots. And um, that's a great thing to have for the service. So we have launched this service in Conway using CARES Act funding. And we launched that in 2022 on October 24th. So we haven't been um, operating for a full year yet, 
but we did launch with the CARES Act funding. And of course, that is one-time funding that hopefully we'll never get again because hopefully we'll never have another global pandemic. Um, so a little bit about microtransit, just to recap for anybody who um, may need a refresher, it's ride hailing, ride sharing service. Um, so I, I underlined ride sharing to make it clear that it's not a personal taxi service. You are not going on a direct path from point A to point B in your own vehicle. That's what a private service is. This is public transit, it's ride sharing. That's what makes us available to spend uh, public transit and mass transit dollars on it because it's, it's ride sharing. Um, it's point-to-point -point accessible public transit service using smaller vehicles, and it's ideal for areas of lower emerging transit demand. Clearly, um, Conway falls, I think, and you'll see this with the updated numbers here in a minute, in the emerging transit category out of those two categories. It's definitely not low demand here. It's, it's definitely been higher demand. Um, and microtransit is a technology-driven a demand response service. So again, it's a familiar interface for anyone who's used Uber or Lyft. A clarification though, it is not the same. When we say familiar, we just mean that it's, it uses an app-based technology primarily to operate, um, but that's where the similarities end. Um, microtransit public transit service is parametered by the time of day that it operates. You know, if I wanna get my own personal Uber, and go from Little Rock to Conway at 2 a.m., I can do that if I'm willing to pay the cost, which is probably very expensive, and if somebody's willing to take me, I can do that. Um, you cannot do that with this service. It's parametered by cost, and it's parametered by the zone geographic areas where you can go. Um, but it does offer more coverage than traditional fixed route bus service because it can go down those smaller roads and neighborhoods. It has a smaller vehicle footprint, so it can go um, to places where bigger buses can't go, which means it has more coverage. And then it's also um, more immediately responsive than what's known as traditional dial-a-ride service in the industry, um, which you may see in other communities. Um, but, and we've talked about this, but unlike Uber and Lyft, you do share a ride. Um, you do get some benefits from having a microtransit fleet in that we have a dedicated uh, specific fleet. This isn't somebody's personal car that they're just using to do um, side service after hours when they have availability to drive for Uber or Lyft or something. And then we also don't have surge pricing. It's predictable fares. Um, and those of you who remember this from before know it's $2 per person per trip here in Conway. Um, it also can support a variety of trip purposes, and we see this all the time here in Conway, people using it to access shopping centers, uh, schools, medical appointments, all of that. And it can be used to gauge demand for transit service um, in the future. And so that's, that's also part of what we're doing as we move along with this operation is to see how the service is performing and whether we want to consider other forms of, of public transit in the future. I know that in the past we've talked about possibly having a fixed route system here in Conway at some point. And um, this is a good way to work up to that. If we see a pattern on certain areas of town, which we are definitely seeing some, some higher, um, you know, some more popular areas in the system as opposed to others. So um, we can talk about that and look at that in the future. Um, and again, this, this service was designed using our professional planning team, which is Foursquare ITP and they use data simulations from our current microtransit software system, which is Transloc. Um, the LOC is for short for location, so it's pronounced Transloc. And we also um, spend a lot of time with the city of Conway staff, including people from the planning team and traffic teams looking at um, trip generators, which is just a fancy word for places where people wanna go, um, taking uh, travel pattern information um, collected uh, by Metro Plan and uh, looking at demographics, where people are living, all of these things uh, go into planning the zone. We also uh, had a series of stakeholder meetings. Um, some of you guys may have participated in some of those back in November 2021 when we were talking to different sectors uh, of folks from Conway, people in the business, health, academic, and social service industries. Okay, and then we had also determined that um, we talked about this when we were planning. After all that planning, um, we we're talking about wait and travel times and what we wanted them to be. And we understood that they're a function of how many vehicles you have in service all day long. And then um, the size of the zone so you can get an average trip length. Um, we budgeted two vehicles to start off with with Conway Microtransit Service. That's what you see today. They operate 14 hours a day, Monday through Saturday, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
And um, the service zone was determined by all of these assessments of the data and the planning that we've been doing. Um, the characteristics uh, of the service were that um, we could have two vehicles in the zone up to about 100 passenger trips per day and keep the average wait time below 30 minutes and the average trip time below 20 minutes. Um, and beyond that, when passenger trips surpass 100 passenger trips per day, you can look at two things, fleet expansion, adding more vehicles, or you can also introduce in the future distance-based pricing. So the further out you go, maybe the higher your fare is because it's more mileage. Um, so there are ways to manage demand. Um, obviously, some are more popular than others, but um, adding vehicles is obviously the most popular, but we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. Um, this is what the zone is and looks like. That's the map of Conway, and it, and it pretty closely follows the borders of the city. Um, and that, that map has not changed since we last visited with everyone about that. And um, here's your update. Um, June, I just pulled the most recent uh, month of metrics, which are so recent, um, even the Conway team hasn't seen these. I got them hot off the press. But June 2023, ridership was record-breaking. We had 137 passenger trips on weekdays as an average. Um, that's a lot. That's more than 100, obviously. Um, we, and fun fact, we surpassed 100 passenger trips on day 14 of service back in 2022. Wow. So the demand has been incredible. That's a good problem to have, but it is a challenge. Um, 3,409 passenger trips in, that should say met at June. Um, that is a record-breaking uh, number of passenger trips for a month. Um, that averages up to about 9.8 passengers per hour. As you can see, the average wait time is still pretty good. It's 22.9. It did creep up from May because May had um, a lower average daily weekday ridership than 137. So the more you creep over that, the longer it gets with the wait times. And then uh, average trip duration was 13.9 minutes. Um, the average trip length was 3.1 miles. So um, this is a 32 mi square mile uh, zone. So that's a lot of coverage. That's a lot of ground that you have to cover. Um, but most of the trips are 3.1 miles. Um, in May, I, I put May for, for this number because that looks more traditional peak time that we see, I think, in Conway, um, 7 to 8 a.m. when people are getting to work, and then later afternoon, 3 to 4 p.m., and uh, school's letting out, things like that. We, we tend to see the peak times on those hours. For June, it was different, and I think that's because it's a summer month. It was more like 10 a.m. was really popular, 5 p.m., and then also 6 a.m. So um, that's a little bit different. Um, but people have different schedules in June, so I wanted to use those May numbers for that um, just because that's more, of, I think, of what we typically see is the 7 to 8 and 3 to 4 p.m. peak. Um, again, those were operating 14 hours of service, um, Monday through Saturday, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., and there are two vehicles in service. Um, there are two additional service vehicles that we have ordered, but they're not delivered. And the reason is um, there is a small bus crisis happening across America uh, within the public transit industry. Um, you can Google it. It's a real thing. <laughs> Just Google small, public, small bus crisis public transit, and you'll find a ton of articles about it. Um, basically, there's a – it was – Pandemic created, I believe, with um, the supply chain issue with vehicles, the same ones that you see in the personal vehicle sector. Um, we seem to have bounced back a little bit in the personal sector, but not as much in the world of small transit vehicles. They're just um, not making enough of them to satisfy the demand for them. If you look at the body style of the Metro Connect vehicles, the next time one passes you and you're on the road, take a good look at it. Because if you imagine it as a gray vehicle instead, you'd be looking at an Amazon Prime vehicle. So we're, we're out there competing with Jeff Bezos and everyone else who needs a vehicle of that size and that make to, to get that many people per vehicle out there. So it's, they're incredibly difficult to find. I think there also is something to be said for the chip manufacturing um, situation as it's ongoing with um, that whole industry. So that's holding up the vehicles. We are doing everything in our power to try to get more vehicles, but this is the situation that we're in and every other public transit's in there with us. Um, we've reached out to our delegation. Everyone who needs to know about this crisis knows about it and knows what our needs are, but that is the situation right now. 
So um, with that said, um, this is just a recap of what we have to support the service right now. Um, and this is not changed from when you guys saw it before, four plus drivers. We always have four throughout the day, basically two people driving in the morning, two different people at, in the evening, and then um, extra people beyond that to um, support uh, vacation and sick days and all that. Um, a supervisor dedicated to Conway, a dispatcher dedicated to Conway, and then all the fixed support and capital that goes into that as well. Um, the fare structure, as we discussed, is $2 per person per trip. Um, it's easy to remember. Um, you could pay it cash or through the token transit app that we have. It's comparable to uh, similar microtransit service in similar markets. And obviously, uh, as we discussed earlier, you could do something in the future like distance-based pricing to kind of tamp down on demand where you have to pay more if you're going further. Or you could just raise the flat fares now if you wanted to try to tamp down a demand. That's obviously a less popular way to curb demand, but it is one way you can do it other than adding vehicles. And you can also shrink the zone. Um, so we, we are continuing to monitor um, the fares. Uh, they seem to be uh, you know, not hampering any of the demand for sure um, right now. So that may be something that we want to consider in the future is, is whether we have landed on the appropriate fare amount. Um, we, the big news today is that we are, in the next couple of months, transitioning our software vendor. We've used the same vendor for microtransit service now for four years. It's Transloc. We're moving over to VIA. VIA is an industry leader. A lot of other public transit agencies across the country use VIA. They're an 11-year-old company. They're headquartered in New York. They have projects all over the country and all over the world. And um, this transition will tentatively occur in September. Um, we're tentatively looking at September 19th, which is a Tuesday. Um, that allows us to roll over some things and be at work on Monday and get some things in place for a transition to a Tuesday launch. And we are looking at tentative public meetings uh, to inform the public about this change in late August, on August 29th and 30th. We'll be working on a lot of messaging about that because there are some key differences when you, when you change vendors in the world of mobility as a software service. Um, the key difference here is that we are moving to a purely on-demand model. And what that means is that um, in Transload, you're able to advance book um, your ride request. And it's still just a ride request. As we discussed when I came out last year to all the public meetings, what it does is put your ride request into a queue about 15 minutes earlier than it normally would have if you had just done it on the fly on demand. With VIA, you won't be able to do that at all. And the reason is, is because um, we have a lot of cancellations and no-shows, and, and that's been proven in the industry to be tied to being able to advance book a ride request. And so this will be something that helps the overall service reduce some of those wait and travel times. Um, because we have had some outlier trips, and I know that some of you on the council have heard of them, and I know that the mayor's heard of them when they've occurred, where the wait time is taking um, a very long time for someone. So this service will be able to um, hopefully cut down on that by going purely on demand. Um, the other thing that VIA does that I think is really rider-friendly is you can see in this graphic that's on the screen, when you put your request in, it will give you some options, and it will not give you those options unless it can actually assign your ride to an available vehicle. If it can't, because they're tied up, it's going to tell you to try again in a few minutes or have a message something similar to that. Because it, right now, it, with Transloc, it will try to book you in there no matter what and put your request in, but that means that you're given an ETA that's dynamic, that changes over time, which can be frustrating if you're in the queue and you're behind maybe 20 people in their ride requests, you don't really have a good sense of how to plan your day because it keeps changing. So this is um, much more reliable um, of a time prediction. So we're hoping that will cut down on the frustration that some people have been experiencing when they had those longer wait times. Um, the other thing is that um, the other key difference is that the system um, is no longer going to allow, um, let's see, uh, you to book a second ride when you're still on your first ride. 
And actually, for those who, who attended those September 2022 meetings, you may remember that that was supposed to be the case with Translote too. But at some point last year, they auto-updated their system and allowed people to start doing that. And they're really not supposed to be able to do that it, because it ties up the vehicle that they're on and kind of ties it to them and lets them kind of hog that vehicle, if you will, for themselves instead of letting, letting the system work as it's supposed to, to be an on-demand system. Um, so you're not going to be able to book a second ride when you're on, you're still doing your first, if that makes sense. So all of these rules and, and um, things that people need to know about how to use VIA, how to set up their accounts, how to manage all that, how it's going to work for them, these are all the things that we plan on covering in August when we come out for those public meetings. And we'll do it kind of like we did last time where we have one that's daytime hours and then one that's after hours so we can try to meet people where they are with their schedules. And... Um, I think it's important though, and I put this slide on here because I wanted to make it clear that just because we're transitioning to a new software vendor, which is really why I'm here to tell you that news, does not mean that it's gonna solve the ongoing capacity challenge because that is tied to how many vehicles are in service. And we still only have two vehicles in service. We're trying to do everything we can to see if our vendors can get us those two, two extra vehicles that are supposed to be going into service delivered as soon as possible. But um, we really don't know when in, as soon as possible will be at this point. So I want to make it clear that we're still going to have a capacity challenge because we planned this service thinking that we could do this up to 100 passenger trips. And I just showed you that we had an average for the month of uh, June of 137 weekday passenger trips. That's, that's nearly, you know, that's nearly... Uh, half of what we started out with, 150% almost. So um, that's a lot. You can, as I said, solve this issue a different way. You could always add more vehicles if you could get them, but then you can also shrink the zone or you can increase the fares. Neither one of those last two bullet points are very popular. So um, that's kind of where we are. That's the message for today. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. The, the new vehicles you may have we've been steadily getting um you know we'll get a vendor who will tell us hey it's going to be this month and then it's been pretty steady throughout the pandemic where they'll say well it's going to be the next month and then it's just the next month the next month and we have monthly meetings with um felicia on the city staff to make sure that everybody's getting the updates that we are and a lot of times those updates are that we have no update from the vendor so that's just been the nature of the small bus crisis. Any questions, Council? Thank you, Ms. Green. Thank you. We Appreciate are, that day. I will say it has been a pleasure to see, though, that there is such a need for public transit in Conway. That is clear. So I think that you've answered that question. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, I agree with you. The last two uh, options are not good ones. We like the new buses coming. So, And I know it's hard to... Uh, compete with uh, with Amazon uh, for, for a bus. So but thank you for the job you do, Justin. Uh, your staff does a tremendous job for the city. Thank you.